Thanks, Neil. That that means a lot. Um, so when I was in eighth grade, I had received my first power wheelchair, and I thought it was about time to go out and test my newfound freedom. So after practicing in my driveway for a few times, my parents, my siblings, and I loaded the new scooter into our car and headed off to Jordan's Furniture. <laughs> and those of you that were laughing already know the story. Um, so now when we got to Jordan's Furniture, it was pouring rain outside, and I decided to turn up my scooter all the way to keep from getting wet. Eighth grade boy, plus new power wheelchair, plus slippery roads, not a good mix. Um, so I thought I was doing fine until I got to the first set of doors. Um, so the first set of doors opened fine and I, and I drove on through. Um, but for some reason the second set of doors didn't open right away. So I did what any 8th grade boy would do. I panicked and I swerved to the left. To the left of these automatic doors was a huge ceiling to floor glass window. <laughs> I drove right through it. Um, so splinters of glass were falling everywhere, and it was just a mess. Like, you don't even know how messy it was. It's crazy. Like, ask anyone who was there. Neil was there. My parents were there. Um, it was a mess. So, well, as you may have guessed, I wasn't really in a hurry to go back to Jordan's Furniture anytime soon. Like, the manager came out, and he wasn't too happy, but he didn't make us pay for it, which is good. Um, but often I feel like breaking down a window is similar to how we have approached the topic of disability in the American church. We head into a situation with the best of intentions, fully desiring to make an impact for the kingdom. But we quickly learn that relationships are hard and messy, and we get nervous, and just as I swerve to the left, we say things we don't mean because we don't know what to say. We are frenzied and confused, and we end up making an impact in the completely wrong way. Tonight I want to identify three misconceptions that the American church has towards disability. These are things that I've either observed from my own life and experience, or things that I've just picked up along the way. But in order to really get a full grasp of my story, we need to go back from the beginning to when I was born. So I was born at 27 weeks, three months premature, and weighed two pounds and five ounces. Needless to say, my birth wasn't one of those happy moments that you see in the movies. I'm a triplet, um, and my two siblings were whisked away with me um, as we began our long road to survive. And it, and it became quickly apparent that something was wrong, as something almost always is when a baby is born that early. The doctors informed my parents that my lungs were collapsing, and they didn't think I was going to make it through the night. It was in that moment that something powerful, something powerful began to take root in my life. My parents are strong believers, and have been going to church and praying for our safe arrival every day for months. When the time came and, and things were not going according to plan, They didn't buckle under the pressure. They didn't, they didn't run away. They didn't hide in the corner. They didn't say, where are you, God? They got on their knees and prayed harder. According to my mom, my dad sat by my side the whole night, singing to me and praying for me. He didn't know if these were the last moments he would spend with his son or what the next few days, weeks, months or years held for me. But he didn't know that it was part of God's plan. So he didn't run from the pressure. He got down on his knees and prayed, and that's why I'm here tonight. Sorry. More actively, I made it through the night, and we began to see the light at, a very dark, at the end of a very dark tunnel. This story is quick to remind me that the power of prayer is real. I firmly believe that 
if my parents hadn't prayed that night, I may not be here today. And if they hadn't prayed throughout the whole process, who knows what would have happened. Um, so this factor of prayer was a continuous running thread throughout my life. Um, when I was first diagnosed with cerebral palsy at six months, doctors had told my parents that they didn't think I would be able to walk, talk, or eat on my own, or live on my own, rather. Um, when they got out of that office, they said they would do anything in their power to make sure that did not come true. And today I'm doing all of those things. They got down on their knees and prayed harder, and that's why I'm here talking to you today about God's plan and God's purpose in my life. And in the moments leading up to our birth, I'm sure my parents were praying for the perfect baby. But there's no such thing as a perfect baby because there's no such thing as perfect people. The first misconception of the American church that I want to talk about tonight is that everything can be solved with ramps, parking spaces, and buttons. If they just have a way to get into the church, everything will be okay, and then they can have their come to Jesus moment, and they'll turn out great. Now, you and I both know that that fact isn't true. Um, yeah, I see way too many churches settling for that reality. Um, in their book, Living Gently in a Violent World, Stanley Hauerwas and Jean Vanier write that above all, people with disabilities desire, uh, cry out for real, authentic relationships. I think this is a similar cry for all of us. We are crying out for this authentic relationship that is life-giving, um, generative, and authentic. But this requires vulnerability on both sides. We have the distinct privilege of being part of God's redemptive, and rest and redemptive plan and his plan of restoration done by the Spirit, but only if we want to be. And this only happens because these generative relationships have already been established. When I was a senior in high school, I was incredibly connected to my youth group and very excited to go on my final winter retreat. As, underclassmen, I remember, as an underclassman, I remember marveling at the seniors' ability uh, to connect with their leaders and each other. Um, and I was excited to turn the page to the next chapter of my life and transition to here at Gordon. Um, unfortunately, I had a play rehearsal that Friday night, so I was forced to drive up late to the retreat where the, uh, to the yeah to the retreat location where the our church was staying. Um, as I walked into the lodge, I was briefly introduced to the speaker, and I quickly ran downstairs to get some cookies. I, those of you who know me, that's pretty characteristic. <laughs> um, now the next morning, when the speaker got up to speak, I realized that he was not your average retreat speaker. He spoke about suffering and pain and why God would allow us to endure so much hurt in our lives. I think it's a necessary topic to address, but I think the way he handled it was in a completely wrong and damaging manner. Um, I was sitting in the front row like a good church kid, and with no prior knowledge of the situation or the context, he said, hey Brad, do you mind if I share something? I said sure, and he continued, the last retreat I spoke at, I met this other boy who was in a wheelchair like Brett, but his disability was far worse than Brett's. He couldn't walk, talk, or eat on his own. Why would a loving God create someone like that? Why would a loving God create someone like Brett? Yeah. In my mind, there are a few things wrong with this story. First of all, it's completely inappropriate to compare disabilities. I have no idea what this boy is suffering from, just as he has no idea what I am suffering from. They are two completely different beasts, and it's completely inappropriate to compare them. Think about it this way. If you and I both had a cold, um, and I said that my cold was far worse than yours, what does that accomplish? Nothing. It doesn't get rid of the fact that we both have colds, and it just makes matters worse. There's no point in it. Another problem I have on a more personal level with the speaker's comments is that it honors some deep and painful questions that I had asked myself in my childhood. Why would God create me with a disability? Was there some mistake? Surely a loving God cannot do this to someone he loves. But here comes the incredible part of the story. The uppouring of love and compassion shown by my youth group 
and the leaders was amazing and frankly, undescribable. At the end of the weekend, I remember feeling so loved and encouraged despite the fact that I was wrestling with these deep-seated issues. That's why authentic relationships are so important, especially to people with physical disabilities. I knew that I had a community that was willing to stand with me and alongside me, even as I wrestled through these tough questions. This is something no program can teach me or no ramp, button, or parking space could accomplish. Churches need to work on facilitating relationships between people with physical disabilities and members of the church community because that is a major way that fruit can grow and these generative relationships can be established. The second misconception of the American uh, church is that people with physical disabilities need to be healed. When I was a freshman in high school, my youth group went to Six Flags, New England to see a Christian concert and to spend the day there. It, w it was a Christian concert, so people were helping hand out flyers um, to advertise the event and just to boost awareness for this particular Christian artist. Um, one of the guys that was helping hand out flyers saw me and my friend walking uh, into the park and ran up to me and said, hey brother, do you mind if I pray for you really quick? A prayer for healing? I didn't know how to respond. I was completely shocked um, and just amazed that he would ask me this question. This guy didn't know me, but he was asking to heal me. There's some sort of disconnect there. I said, I'm actually okay. Thanks, though. And we started walking on our way. But the guy caught up to us and said, Hey, brother, I, I, I really want to pray for you. Because I think that if I pray, I know that God is a God of healing and that he could do that for you today. He prayed, and we walked away. And that's the one thing I remember about that trip to Six Flags. I don't remember anything else about that day, but I do remember the guy who came and prayed for me. There was something about that guy's approach that really rubbed me the wrong way. And it took me a few years to realize exactly what it was. The first is that he said, I think if I pray for you, something will happen. Theologically, that's not how it works at all. It isn't because he prayed or he did something and, I was, and that person was healed. It's because God in all his mercy and goodness reached down, picked us up, and did something, and that person's healed. We don't do anything. We just become a mouthpiece by which God can speak, move, and heal. The only thing that can heal is God working through the Spirit. The second thing that he neglected to think about was that he neglected the fact that I was already healed. Not physically healed, but spiritually healed. I see God's presence in my life every day. God is the reason I'm here. He's the reason I'm alive. And I have no excuse not to rejoice in that fact, healed or not. I used to think that I needed to be healed in order to make a difference. Now I know that God can use me just the way I am. When I was a freshman in high school, I was having some pretty severe knee pain. And after consultation with my doctors, they decided that I needed to have um, pretty major surgery on my knees. Because of the way I walk, an immense amount of pressure is put on my knees, uh, causing arthritis to form. The surgery was intended to take, uh, to, uh, take away this arthritis and just reconstruct my knees so I could walk better. Um, despite the fact that I had this surgery, doctors say that I'll need a full knee replacement probably within the next 10 years. Um, yeah. So when doctors started the surgery, they discovered that there was a lot more arthritis in there than they had originally expected. The surgery turned into a 12-hour ordeal. My family was the first to arrive and the last to leave. I thought the worst was over. Little did I know that the worst was coming. A few days into my stay at the hospital, uh, doctors found that because of the amount of anesthesia that they had given me and the, and the length of the procedure, um, I had begun to collect fluid in my lungs and I was unable to breathe correctly. Before I knew it, I was put on a respirator and headed to intens the intensive care unit. 
completely unprepared for some of the hardest moments of my life. There was never any fear that I would die in that hospital bed, but there was noticeable concern about what was going on. For me, I was having some real questions about God. It was the first time in my life where I really doubted God. Why would God make me with a disability? And what's God's plan for me? In that hospital bed, staring at the blank, unfamiliar ceiling, I began to lose hope in the God who claimed he loved me. One night as I was trying to sleep, I decided to listen to some music. Um, if you see my iPod, it mostly has Christian music on it, so that's what it was. Um, I don't remember the song, but I do remember it was a Christian song, and I fell asleep. As, as I fell asleep, with the doubt still swirling in my mind, God finally showed up. As I slept that night, I knocked the respirator out of my mouth. I was suddenly able to breathe normally again. We can make our lives as neat or as tidy as we want them to appear as we walk around campus. But imagine if God were to go inside your life and look at the things that you don't want him to see. I bet there are a whole litany of things in your own life and in mine that you wouldn't want God to see. Maybe you keep them under the carpet. Maybe they're behind a locked door. These are the things that make us feel unworthy or inadequate. Now, if God walked into my life, he would see the biggest bad thing that I thought was true about myself, just sitting on the couch for everyone to see. He's just watching TV and hanging out. The thing that I once thought made me so unworthy or inadequate was sitting right there on the couch. Friends, I'm here to tell you today that God can walk into the door of your life look under that carpet or behind that locked door and look at the things that are messy about our lives and say, I like that. It's mine. You see the flaws in your life and you kick them under the rug or the bad things about yourself and you lock them away. God is able to look at those things and say, I like that. It's mine. Now, if God, the creator of the universe, the most perfect thing ever created, can say that about the undesirable qualities in our lives, maybe it's time that we look under the carpet or behind that locked door or on the couch and start examining those things too. I'm living proof that God can take the things that are messy in our lives and make them something so beautiful. We need to examine those things so that we can find the beauty too. On that night in the ICU, I am convinced that God healed me. He didn't physically heal me, but he spiritually healed me from the doubt I was experiencing. He answered my questions, and I felt as if God was saying to me, I have you, I'm here, and I will never let you go. He was looking at the thing that I thought was so ugly, that I thought was the one blemish to myself, and saying, I like that. It's mine. Now, when I think of this story, I think of something that Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. It'll be up on the screen as well, so don't worry about it. Um, but we have this treasure in jars of clay that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. This power that we have is not from us, but from God. I don't know about you, but when I hear a verse like that, I get chills. This power that we hold is not from us, but from God. We know that we have this power, and when we feel like we are being crushed on all sides, that the walls are closing in on us, when it feels like God has left us, and we can't seem to find the good in a bad situation, we have this all-surpassing power, hidden in jars of clay, that this all-surpassing power is from God, 
and not from us. God is in the midst of transforming situations where we feel like we have no hope and using them for his glory. Friends, I want to tell you tonight that if you find yourself in a situation where it feels like you cannot escape, God is redeeming that. God is restoring that, and God is transforming that. And he will make something good out of it. To me, a physical healing is not the answer. Because God has already healed me spiritually and has made something good about what the world perceives as so bad. One more note on healing. I'm not discounting the power or the beauty of, physical, of miraculous healings, but I do believe that these healings are only performed when the witness is stronger because of them. If me being healed right now in this moment would be a stronger witness point people towards God, I believe he would do it like that. But I firmly believe that God, um, I firmly believe that my life will be used as a stronger witness towards God with a disability. The last misconception that I fear has gripped the American church is that people with disabilities cannot lead. I used to think that leadership was all about outward action and appearance. Now I know it's all about the heart. Throughout my life, I've come to recognize my disability, not as a crutch keeping me from people, but as an arrow that can point people towards God. And to share the gospel. Now, I think a lot of this comes from my reading and reflection on God's word and a fuller understanding of myself, my vocation, and my calling. But I think a lot of this has come through my study of John 9. I think that this man by the pool of Siloam is a paradigm for the way that we look at disability and we look at faith itself. When Jesus heals the man of his blindness, he is not only restoring his sight, but he is restoring his faith as well. Amos Young, who we heard from in chapel this morning, writes in his book, The Bible of Disability in the Church, A New Vision for the People of God, that this man coming to be a disciple, this man who comes to be a disciple only after he is healed, not necessarily because he is no longer blind, but because he has moved from spiritual darkness to light and coming to accept Jesus as Lord. The transformative action happens not by what is on the outside, but what is on the inside. I believe this is the mantra that the world must take in regards to leadership. Too often, I feel like we are looking for the perfect person to lead our companies, classrooms, or congregations, judging only by external appearance. But we know that 1 Samuel 16, 7 says that people look at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And we see this personified in John 9. Even after the man is healed, he is still referred to as the blind man, by his neighbors and the Pharisees. They are looking at his outward appearance, but Jesus, he looks at the heart. It is interesting to note uh, that to Jesus, this former blind man is the only one seen correctly in this whole narrative. The disciples focus only on the man's supposed sin. His neighbors still see him as a blind beggar. The Pharisees are looking at him as a traitor and a blasphemer. His own parents don't even recognize the physical miracle, for they are afraid of being kicked out of the synagogues because of his claims. So they leave him to fend for himself. But when Jesus sees this man, he sees a child of the Most High who has come from darkness to light. The healing of the man's blindness is not only restoring his sight so that he can see the light of day, but restoring his sight so that he can see the light of the world. This is what the church calls us to. And this is what it means to be Christian leaders. This is why the man has become a paradigm for the Christian faith. God calls us not to look at difference as the broken link by which unity cannot occur, but as the bridge by which others can walk across and call upon his name. And that's what it means to be Christian leaders. It's not the man's difference that made him a threat to the Pharisees. It's the fact that he saw Jesus. 
So I've learned that we need to enter into authentic relationships. I've learned that spiritual healing is far greater than any physical healing. And I learned that leadership comes from the heart and is not based in outward appearance. Gordon College, I'm praying that we do not become a community defined by our differences, but a community that is united in the fact that we have seen Christ. My life is living proof that God is here and he is active. If it was not for God, I wouldn't be sitting here speaking to you tonight. Paul says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. Looking back at my life, I wouldn't change a thing if it meant that I could not know Christ. I thank God that I have been able to experience knowing Christ in a tangible and personal way. And I pray that if you have not found him yet, that he will put people and events into your path so that you might meet him. Thank you.